What's up guys, D here, and today I'm going to show you something that happened a couple days ago. I got to meet Laverne Cox, and she is so amazing and so talented, and I am just so excited about everything. And the next 20-ish minutes is going to be what I recorded when she came to visit us. So, hope you enjoy! And women's rights activists spoke those powerful words, Ain't I a Woman, in an iconic speech on May 29, 1851. It happens to be my birthday. <laughs> All right! Different year, though. <laughs> She wasn't really a woman because she was black. She, she spoke those words in a social context that denied her very humanity because she was black. There's a famous story about Sojourner Truth in 1858. She was giving a speech and someone yelled from the audience accusing her of being a man. And she, she famously opened her blouse and revealed her breast. Now I'm not going to reveal my breast tonight. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint some of you. And I saw this handheld fan. And the second I saw it, I knew I had to have it. It had peacocks on it. It was fabulous. <laughs> and, and what you should know about this is that I had seen Gone with the Wind a few weeks before that. And for those of you who don't know, the heroine of Gone with the Wind, Scarlett O'Hara, famously fans herself with a handheld fan in a very fabulous way. And so I'm sitting in third grade fanning myself. <laughs> Just fanning away, feeling very... Scarlett O'Hara feeling very gone with the wind, fabulous. And Miss Ridgeway looks at me and she says, Come here and bring that thing with you. And then she marches me down the hall to Miss Fairley's classroom and she says, Show her what you were doing with that thing. And I'm like, Yeah. I'm <laughs> and she's like, Okay, stop. And then go back to class. And then my mother. And so, so I'm sitting in the therapist's office, and I remember the therapist asked me if, if I knew the difference between a boy and a girl, and in my infinite wisdom as a third grader, because third graders are so wise, right? <laughs> I said, there is no difference. Now, now, this is years before Judith Butler and gender theory, but the way that I, I reasoned in my mind at the time is that everyone was telling me that I was a boy, but I knew that I was a girl. I, I knew in my soul that I was a girl. And so I reasoned that there must not be any difference. Now, now as a kid, I watched a tremendous amount of television. I still do. Um, <clears throat> and on television, I had heard about this thing called doctor-patient privilege. And so I had assumed that everything I said to the therapist was between me and the therapist. But, but apparently, third graders do not have doctor-patient privilege. <laughs> so everything I said to the therapist, my mother found out about. And my mother yelled at me. When my mother would yell, the whole entire house would shake. And my mother um, said to me, you're a boy, and boys are this, and girls are this, and you can't act this way. And, and it was another moment in my childhood that my, my gender, my gender expression was not only being policed by, by the other kids, but by my teacher, by, by a therapist, and my mother. Um, I, I continued to go to the therapist for um, a few more sessions, and eventually um, it was suggested that, that um, I be injected with testosterone to make me more masculine. And luckily for me, a red flag went up for my mother. Something didn't quite seem right about injecting her child with testosterone. So, so the therapy was discontinued, but, but the damage was done. So we were members of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, does anyone know the Amy Church here? Hey, all the time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it was Wendy Williams who say, "Hi, you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> Called my my Salvation Army Couture, Salvation Armani, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and and I was a huge fan of culottes too. As a kid. I loved culottes, and the great thing about culottes, right, is that they 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 looked like a skirt, but they were really short. And so when the kids would say, "Are you wearing a skirt?" I would say, "No, they're shorts." And I had this pair of black velvet culottes that were just amazing to me. 
and I wore them all the time, even in the dead summer in Alabama, which was really hot. I was wearing velvet in the summer. I was like, I was like, yeah. and, um, and they were awesome. And I started wearing makeup in high school, and I had a shaved head. So I started existing in this sort of gender, non-conforming, androgynous space when I was at the Alabama School of Fine Arts. So, I graduated from ASFA as a dance major, and then I got into Indiana University at Bloomington, not too far from here, and I, so I went to IU Bloomington for two years and studied dance there, and then I transferred to Marymount Manhattan College, and finally I was in New York City! <laughs> and I say it that way, New York City! <laughs> I over impersonation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> myself, becoming more of myself. So I continue to be a pretty good student at Marymount, reading my books, my butler, my Foucault, etc. Um, but a huge part of the education I got in New York City happened in the nightclub scene. <laughs> Stay with me. Um, <laughs> so when I arrived in, in New York City, it was the early 90s, giving my age away a little bit. <clears throat> and, and it was the age of the club kid. Has anyone seen that film Party Monster? Yeah, not the greatest movie in the world. Um, with Macaulay Culkin, um, Chloe Sevigny, Seth Green are in it. Um, but it sort of gives you a sense of, of what the New York City club scene was like in, in, in the early 90s. And um, there, there was all a, it was, it was really wonderful because these, these people, these club kids, basically club kids were folks who got paid to dress outrageously often in various forms of gender nonconformity, androgyny, drag. Um, they got paid to dress outrageously and go to nightclubs and party. I mean, like, how cool is that? You just like to look fabulous and party and get paid. Um, what a dream. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, there was all this amazing creativity and and pageantry in all of it, and it was just wonderful. And it was for the first time for me when I arrived in New York in my Salvation Armani and my gender non-conformity. It was the first time in my life that my gender expression was something that was celebrated, that was looked at as something that should be um, valorized. I, I would walk up to the hottest nightclubs in New York City and go to the velvet ropes and they would let me ride in. I never had to pay. They would let me in for free. They would give me drink tickets so I could drink for free. And I didn't even drink at the time. I gave the drink tickets to my friends. But it was this wonderful time of who I was and my creativity and my expression was something that was celebrated and I felt like a star. I felt awesome. And the people that I would meet in the club scene of New York City would change my life. And there was one particular person who went by the name of Tina Sparkles. <laughs> Tina Sparkles. I love that name. And boy, boy, does she sparkle. And I met Tina <coughs> at, a new, at a nightclub called Webster Hall. Um, Hall. It still exists in New York, which is pretty remarkable. Um, clubs don't usually last very long in, in New York City. But I met her there back in the day. There was a party on Friday nights called Makeup Room. And I, ironically, was powdering my nose in Makeup Room. And Tina comes up to me and asks to borrow my powder because she had forgotten hers at night. And we became um, friends, not super close friends, but whenever I went out, I would see her and we would talk. Now, a little bit about Tina. She was African American. <laughs> Actually, she probably still is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tina, Tina Sparkles is African American. She was about six five, six six in heels, and she the night I met her, she was wearing this big, huge Diana Ross hair that she wore often, and she kind of had this pimply acne, um, not the smoothest skin in the world, but she was one of the sweetest queens that you would meet. And over the next several years of knowing Tina, I watched her transform from this statuesque queen to a beautiful, elegant, sophisticated woman with flawless skin. And, and I remember saying to myself, if Tina can do this, what can I do? And if it weren't for Tina Sparkles and all of the amazing transgender women I met in the club scene of New York City, I might not have ended up at Dr. Wish's office 16 years ago for my first hormone shot in the beginning of my medical transition. Now this part of my story for me um, is so meaningful because I had so many misconceptions about who transgender people were based on what I had seen in the media, based on the fear of God that was put in me um, by Miss Ridgeway and, and my mother about ending up in New Orleans wearing a dress. 
I didn't associate being transgender with being successful and accomplished. And I was being groomed by my mother and my teachers to be a successful, accomplished person. And then I actually met real transgender people. And I got to know them as people. And as I got to know these trans folks, all of the misconceptions I had about transgender people melted away. And I was able to fully accept them and ultimately myself. And I, I believe this could be the journey for each and every one of us. If we, have, if we have misconceptions about people who are different from us, I believe if we just get to know them as people, if we get to know them as people, all those misconceptions will melt away. Now, um, I imagine that, that my transition might go a little bit like Tina's, that two, three years into my transition, I'd be able to walk down the street and no one would ever know that I was trans. I could live as the woman I was always meant to be and be happy, healthy, and free. Uh, two, three years into my transition, this wasn't quite happening. Four, five, six years into my transition, still not happening. I would walk down the street and I would still get spooked. Now, now, spooked is a New York City colloquialism for in the trans community for being, I um, mean, someone can look at you and tell that you're transgender. Uh, other parts of the country, trans folks, they clocked. Uh, but since I still live in New York, I'll, I'll say spooked. Now, now, when folks would spook me back in the day, I would feel like, I would often feel unsafe, I would often feel like a failure, like what am I doing that they're not seeing the woman that I really am? And I gotta tell you, it took me many, many years to really internalize that if someone can look at me and tell that I'm transgender, that's okay. Because being transgender is beautiful, and it's something that should be celebrated, and it's awesome. Um, but, but we don't live in a culture that, that celebrates transness, it celebrates the beauty of what it means to be trans. I feel like to think about um, back in the, um, in, the, in the 70s, in the early 70s, there was this phrase in um, Black Liberation Struggle, um, Black is Beautiful. Remember? Well, you don't remember, but I've heard of it. I don't remember either, but like, I know my history. <laughs> and there's this wonderful phrase, Black is Beautiful, and I, and I, and I like thinking trans, like, what if we start saying trans is beautiful? And all of those things that make trans people different, and they, they, if we start celebrating those things as so it's taken me a while, and it's still a struggle every day to like look at myself in the mirror and say that the thing, all everything about myself is beautiful, um, flaws and all. To quote Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> so so when folks would spook me uh, on the street, they they wouldn't say, "I think that's a transgender woman over there." That wouldn't be what they would say. No, they would usually say something like, "That's a man." <laughs> oh 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 oh, that's a man right there. That's a man. basically threatened me. 
So, um, about six years ago, I'm walking in my neighborhood in Midtown Manhattan, and I passed this group of young men, and as I passed them, I heard anti-gay slurs, anti-trans slurs. One of them called me a man, and then one of them kicked me. And I, I remember sort of standing there for a moment in shock. I was like, Did this just really happened to me? And I, and I immediately retreated into a nearby store and called the police. And by the time um, the police got there, the perpetrator said had left the scene. And I have to tell you that I had a pretty decent experience with the police. A lot of trans folks don't feel so safe going to the police. A lot of black folks don't feel so safe going to the police. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, but I had a decent experience with the police that day. And I felt empowered filing a, a police report um, just to tell the police, the world, that I did not deserve to be treated this way. Um, but even though I, there, was, there was something empowering about filing a police report, I still have a tremendous amount of trauma around that having happened to me. I often, um, with that, if I don't do the right meditation, the right mental preparation, I, I leave my apartment wondering if like, today is going to be the day that it's today going to be the day that I'm assaulted by someone who just has a problem with me being who I am. Um, lots of trauma around that. But, but even though um, I have a lot of trauma around that incident. I feel very lucky that that is the worst of what has happened to me, at least as an adult trans woman, because far too often, for far too many trans people, it, it's much, much worse. On August 17th of 2013, a young woman, a young African-American trans woman by the name of Alon Nettles, was walking down the street in Harlem, New York, with a friend of hers, and she passed a group of young men, and she was catcalled by, by this group of young men. One of them realized that, that she was trans and beat her into a coma. Five days later, she died. Um, over a year, it's over a year later, and there's yet to be an arrest for the homicide of Elon Nettles. Far too often, the, the deaths, the murders of transgender people go unsolved. Um, a, a little bit about, more about what happened that night. Um, when, when the police finally arrived, they, they, they pulled a young man off of the lawn nose who was beating her and they arrested him uh, on the spot and charged him with assault. Five days later when she, when she died, they eventually dropped those assault charges in the hopes of bringing homicide charges against this young man. Um, but it's over a year later and they have yet to do this. Um, this is a lot of like he, a friend of his who looks similar to him, also confessed. It's, I mean, it's like a, it's a mess. It's a mess. But, but, but at the end of the day, oh gosh, justice. What is justice? It's hard. It's hard. I mean, a week after what happened in, in, in Ferguson, it's hard. It's, it's intense thinking about what justice looks like in this country for me. Um, but but I, I feel that Elon Nettles and her family can use some justice. They can use some love today. When someone's life is taken, when a trans life is taken, when a black life is taken, someone should be accountable for that loss. Someone. Um, I, I gotta tell you, um, stories like Elon Nettles um, touch me to my core because I know, I, I know that, for, but for the grace of God, I could be Elon Nettles. Um, so many moments in my life I've been walking down the street and I've been catcalled and, and someone has realized I'm trans and so very easily it could have turned really deadly. Um, there, there was a moment about 12, 13 years ago, um, I was walking um, to the 72nd Street subway. I lived on the Upper West Side um, of Manhattan at the time and it was the 4th of July. I was wearing red, white, and blue, red, white, and blue dress. I was, it was really tight. I was feeling very patriotic. Um, <laughs> and, and as I walked to the subway, I passed these two young men. One of the young men appeared to be African-American, and the other uh, young man appeared to be Latino. And as I passed them, the Latino guy says, Yo, ma, you're looking sexy today, yo. Can I holler at you, yo? Something like that. <laughs> and, and then the black guy said, Yo, dude, that's an N-word, yo. Something like that. And the Latin guy said, You're too good to be an N word. That's a B word, yo. And then they began to argue. I said, N word, it's a B word, it's an N word, it's a B word. And I'm standing there waiting for the light to change and saying, God, get me out of here. <laughs> and and um, I got out of there safely, thank God. But, but that 
moment makes me think about the interesting intersections of identity and oppression uh, far too many trans people, tra purely trans women of color, experience every single day. Just to have your gender debated in front of you is like a really intense, weird thing um, that a lot of trans folks um, that I've talked to have experienced. Um, but, but then there's all these, these other elements. So let's break this situation down a little bit. Um, so first of all, I was catcalled, and there's this lovely catcalling video online. Have you mm. seen it? Mm, um, yep. It's not lovely, but it, it really, if you live in New York City and you're a woman, it like really encapsulates what the experience is like. So first of all, I am being catcalled because I'm a woman, and um, now some trans women that, that I, I know um, feel that being catcalled is affirming of their womanhood. I've never felt this way. I've often felt that, that when I'm catcalled, it's like these men are trying to objectify me, take ownership of my body in this public space, and I often feel unsafe, and it feels like a misogynist act to me. So, so we have this misogynist act of me being catcalled, and then one of them realizes that I'm trans, and so we have this misgendering moment, um, and, so, and so that, that, that we have this transphobic moment, and I'm truly surrounded calls this intersection of tra uh, transphobia and misogyny, trans misogyny. So we have this trans misogynist moment, and then we have the racial component. So, so uh, the use of the N word in this in this context. Now, I've come to understand that when people of color use the N word to refer to me, um, it's usually tantamount to them saying that's a man, but not only that's a man, but that's a black man. Now, we understand that the N word can be re-signified based on context, but um, so, so I mean, I guess they could have used the N word if I were white, but I think it has something to do with me being black, and and <laughs> and also <laughs> um, and also. Um, the reality of my experience in, that I've often said and, um, and gotten been criticized for is that most of the bullying and harassment I've experienced in my lifetime has been from other black folks. Now, I'm always careful to say this is not to suggest that black folks are more homophobic or transphobic than everybody else. I don't believe that. But I, but I do believe um, that, that, that often marginalized groups police each other. So black folks police other black folks, gay folks police other gay folks, women police other women, trans folks police other trans folks, etc. etc. So I think there's this element of policing within groups that happens. And I think for black folks in America, there's something else going on. Um, in America, we have a literal history of emasculating black men, a literal history during slavery, Reconstruction, Jim Crow. Um, black male bodies were routinely <coughs> lynched. Often um, during these lynchings, their genitalia was, was often cut off. Um, sometimes they would pickle the genitalia and sell the genitalia. So we have a literal history of emasculating black men. It's a horrible, awful history that I'd rather not think about, but it is our shared collective history as Americans. And I believe that a lot of black folks have, have looked at me in various incarnations of my femininity throughout my life and imagined that I am the realization of the historic emasculation of black men. And they have, have, have lashed out at me in a tremendous amount of pain. There's this wonderful expression that, um, that some of you probably know. It's, hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people so often. We're in, in so much pain from, from discrimination, from oppression, that we don't know what to do with that pain. So we often take it out on each other. And, wow, we often take it out on each other. And, and, and so that makes me think that how do we begin to create spaces of healing? Create spaces of healing from, from the intense pain and trauma from the collective oppression far too many of us experience um, from these systems um, that, that, that we exist under. <clears throat> Um, speaking of, of healing, I can't help but think about my own mother. Um, about eight months into my um, medical transition, I called my mother and I said, Mom, I'm transitioning, I'm, I'm starting a medical transition, I'm a woman, that's what's been going on with me my whole life. And the first thing my mother said to me was, but you have such big hands and feet. <laughs> that was the first thing she said. And I'm like, Mom, it's not about that. It's going to be okay. Um, <clears throat> but I got to tell you, it was really difficult for my mother. It was really difficult. She had to get used to calling me a different name. Now, Laverne was always my middle name. She named me Laverne as my middle name. And Cox was always my last name. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thought of changing it, but, you know, honoring the family. 
name, and so when I transitioned, I dropped my old first name. So my mother had to get used to calling me a different name. She had to get used to using different gendered pronouns to refer to me. And, and pronouns matter, by the way, when we talk with and about transgender people. There, there was a moment about a year and a half ago, I was going to Calaloo Community Health Center in New York City. It's, it's, an, it's a community health center that caters to the LGBT community. And I've been going there for over a decade, and this never happened. But this one day, I went in, and the nurse comes into the examining room and says to me, Hi, my name is David. I identify as male, and my preferred gender pronouns are he and him. How about you? And I was like, work. <laughs> I really said, work! <laughs> and, and I love that because it's a great way to, to create set of safe space for people to self-identify. Creating safe space for people to self-identify, I love that. And I'm also proud to report that now, when someone uses the wrong pronoun to refer to me in front of my mother, she corrects them. Yeah. That's pretty awesome, and, but we did not get there easily. It took a lot of years and a lot of difficult conversations across difference for us to get there, but I'm very lucky that my mother has always wanted me in her life. She's always wanted me to be happy. Um, so we had those very difficult conversations uh, across difference, and eventually we got there. It took, um, oh God, me sending her books and articles and videos, and just a lot, a lot of really difficult conversations. Speaking of difficult conversations, um, I want to end with this. Um, earlier this year, I um, gave the opening keynote at a conference called Creating Change, and this year it was in Houston, Texas, and I was totally freaking out about what I was going to say to this particular group of, of activists, and um, a dear friend of mine, Jeremiah Johnson, was, was at the conference, and so I called Jeremiah, I was like, I'm freaking out, and he came to my room, and he reminded me that day that he and I have had some very difficult conversations across difference. He reminded me, um, he, Jeremiah is a, a white gay man, he's also living with HIV, and he's a fierce AIDS activist, and he reminded me that he's often not known what the right things to say to me might be as a black transgender woman. He's been afraid of saying the wrong things. And he reminded me that I've often been afraid of saying the wrong things to him, a person living with HIV. But we had those conversations anyway. We, we took risks and allowed ourselves to be vulnerable and to make mistakes. And um, I gotta tell you, I'm so grateful that we took those risks. The understanding that I have about the extent to which we stigmatize people with HIV in country. I wouldn't have that understanding if I didn't take the risk to say the wrong things to Jeremiah and allow myself to be vulnerable. And today is World AIDS Day and I, I can't help but think of um, how many people are still being left behind in the fight um, to end HIV AIDS. And, and that is a wonderful relationship that I have in my life that I wouldn't have if I were afraid um, and I didn't allow myself to be vulnerable and to have um, take the risk to have difficult conversations across difference. So I, I charge each and every one of you today to take the risk to allow yourself to be vulnerable and make mistakes, but create safe space so you can take risk uh, with each other and make mistakes so that you can um, have those difficult conversations across difference with love and empathy and towards getting to a better understanding of who the other person is and ultimately of who you are. Thank you so much, Butler University.